coming. I've been asked to remind you to quiet your cell phones. My name is Andrew Scott, and for myself, and on behalf of my mother, Evelyn, and on behalf of our family, I thank you all for attending this memorial with my father, Douglas Scott. I also thank the college and the wonderful alumni department for hosting and organizing the celebration of his life. In an email exchange I had in preparing for this celebration, someone wrote to me and said, it's hard to know and to comprehend one's own father the way other people in their lives know him, but for all of us who knew your dad, in other contexts, he was a true inspiration. So today, we're gonna to hear a few people say a few words about my dad. And as you can see from that email, I'm guessing that a few of those people will pay him a small compliment or two. Some of those that speak today knew dad as a colleague or as a friend. Others knew him as a teacher or a college administrator. Still others knew him as a student. And that's because dad was, in fact, all of those things. Dad was a Renaissance guy. For better or worse, though, I'm the only one who knew him as a father, which means that among what are going to be a lot of comments today about how amazing and how inspirational and how wonderful Dad was, isn't it my job as a son to also remember a few of Dad's flaws with all of you? <laughs> Someone has to keep it real. Isn't that what sons do? Dad was born in Oakland, California in 1941. A male child born in 1941 had a life expectancy of 70 years, which means that Dad should have died in 2011. And that brings me to Dad's first flaw. He was a procrastinator. <laughs> Dad was diagnosed with kidney cancer in 2009, and when doctors told Dad about his cancer, they also said he had about an 80% chance of dying within the next five years. But did dad do that? <laughs> nope. He procrastinated his own death. <laughs> when I was around 11 years, uh, I'm sorry, when I was around 8 years old or so, I developed an interest in making model cars. You know, those plastic model cars that you painted and glued together with maybe 30 or 40 pieces. Dad saw me doing this and wanted to join me in it in a fatherly way. So he bought a model car for himself to make. But it wasn't just any model. It was a 1932 Duesenberg SJ Roadster, one of the most expensive and exotic cars of its day. Many parts of it, like the body and the fenders and the hood, were made of metal. It had over 150 parts. The engine alone has 34 pieces, and I only know that from reading the box just the other day. Dad got pretty far along with that metal model, but he never finished it. He worked on it, but only while I was working on a model of my own. And as time went on, my attention turned to other things, and so did his. Later on in life, he and I and Mom joked often about that metal model. He said he was waiting for a good time to finish it. As I've reflected on what it means to be a procrastinator, oh, and did I mention it's genetic? <laughs> I have it. So does Mitchell, my oldest grandson. I'm sorry, my father's oldest grandson. I've come to the conclusion that it's directly tied to being an optimist. Procrastinators have a firm belief that there will be plenty of time to do something later. And on top of that, they, Dad, me, Mitchell too, seem to be pretty fairly convinced that everything's going to turn out great. Optimists believe the world is generally a good place and that people generally believe honorably and decently. It bothers them deeply when they see things that don't adhere to that worldview. They try to better themselves and those around them and to work toward fixing the wrongs of the world. That was bad too. Who else but a procrastinator slash optimist could spend 15 years writing a novel attempting to understand and to humanize and to explore the possibility of feeling compassion for a Nazi doctor? That was my father. 
Dad identified himself as Jewish. In talking with him later in life, he told me that aside from being a teacher, the other career he considered was being a rabbi. In 1960, nearing the end of college, Dad went to Germany, where he met Evelyn, a good German Protestant. And what does a Jewish boy who is contemplating a career as a rabbi do when he meets a good, beautiful German Protestant woman? Well, he eventually marries her, of course. <laughs> this marriage set up my parents for some challenges when it came to passing on religious beliefs as they raised me. We celebrated Easter or Christmas throughout my childhood because mom, who had by now emigrated to the United States, missed her traditions in Germany, or at least that's what dad told me. Candidly, I'm not sure I really even knew Dad was Jewish until a high school friend told me that her dad and my dad were Jewish friends. <laughs> it's not a surprise that Dad was open to all kinds of religious beliefs and explored spirituality as a student in religion, a student of religion, in many directions over the years. While he may have put aside his Judaism during my childhood, he found it again later and studied it, along with other variations of faith from Methodism to Quakerism to Buddhism and to mindfulness. As I said, he was a Renaissance guy. And that brings me to Louis Sierra. Louis met my father in 2009 when Dad took a mindfulness course taught by Louis. Louis and Dad hit it off quickly as Dad, recently diagnosed with kidney cancer at that point, wanted to further his, explore his spirituality. So let me welcome to the stage now, Louis Sierra.
I feel honored that Evelyn asked me to be part of this celebration of Doug's life. She suggested that I do uh, an invocation, something spiritual and not religious. So I'm not a priest or a rabbi or a monk, so I'm on safe ground. Because of the following quote by French philosopher Pierre Gaillard de Chardin, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. So with this in mind, uh, I'll do my best to comply with Evelyn's request. But first I'd like to say a few words. So I'm invoking, I guess, the Jewish part of Doug. <laughs> uh, I ran across this many years ago, and for some reason it really stuck with me, and I had prepared something else, and then I remembered it. <clears throat> and I said to my wife, Libby, you know, it's this great story. And so I'm going back to this, and some of you may have heard of this. According to Jewish mysticism and Kabbalistic teaching, every generation has no less than 36 righteous people living on earth, known as the Lamed Bab Zedikim, also known as the Lamed Bavnit. Their purpose is to save the world through acts of righteousness. They use the gifts, and talents which they possess to lift all of those around them. Without them, the world would end. I'm not clear on how the Talmud interprets righteousness, and I'm not a Talmudic scholar, so I will not engage in that. <laughs> but I'm taking the freedom of giving it my interpretation. And to me, righteousness is about a person's willingness to cultivate virtuous qualities, to live a life of integrity, that make that human being perfect in their imperfections. Considering this definition, then righteousness is rooted in awareness. It is living an awakened and connected life, willing to turn to everyone and everything in this world, regardless of whether we like it or not, versus living a life, a disassociated life, a numbed out life, self-preoccupied life, greedy, aversive, resentful, and defended. In other words, living a life without blame. The teaching states that the Lamed Vavniks live among us, look like us, yet they are unknown to the world and cannot be known to others or to themselves. They do their best to do what is wholesome, to point out what is unethical and unwholesome, and to take action. They are humble servants of humanity, tirelessly dedicated to bringing light to the darkness, showing compassion, speaking out and addressing issues that are often uncomfortable and inconvenient. The Lamed Vavniks arise, do what they're meant to do, and then they disappear into their lives. My sense is that Doug was one of these righteous beings. Zedek. He dedicated his life to understanding what makes us human and taught that if we could become more aware of ourselves, our intentions and motivations, then we held the potential for becoming more compassionate, kind, and ethical beings. This would contribute to our own well-being, that of our family, community, country, and the world. Doug was dedicated to understanding and to helping others understand a world that often seems on fire, a world that seems to be burning. Throughout his life, he contributed to drawing attention to those areas in need of understanding, compassion, and kindness. Now, this doesn't mean he had it all worked out and that he didn't struggle or make mistakes. But if you really had the fortune to listen to Doug with your heart, not just with your mind, but with your heart, you couldn't help but hear his heart break, get angry, sad, find humor, and sing with joy. He had a beautiful presence, and he gave, me so, mu he gave so much to so many, not just those he was close to, but those who came close to, me, to him. He was a lovely embodiment of a mensch. During Doug's last few weeks, 
I visited him regularly at Meadowbrook. I'd sit with him. Sometimes he'd ask me to put my hand on his forehead for some reason. Maybe my hand was cold. It made him feel good. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we'd chat. Sometimes I helped out with a meal, and sometimes I just sat there while he was, you know, sometimes listening to music, sometimes people came in and out, but many times he was asleep. And if we were alone, I would sit with him, experiencing the deep sense of stillness that surrounded him during those final days. It was a type of meditation for me to be present. I found that if we aren't caught in our fear or resistance of death, a spaciousness opens full of quietude and grace. I was fortunate to receive this gift from Doug. What I'd like to offer this morning as a tribute to him is quite simple. I offer it to him recognizing that he was a wonderful human being who was perfect in his imperfections, who embodied the most noble qualities a human can cultivate. Kindness, compassion, curiosity, friendliness, wisdom, and humor. Hopefully with this brief centering practice, we can all bring ourselves more wholeheartedly into this celebratory space with an open and tender heart. I like to think of Doug as one of those people that I've met in my experience so far in this life that have a very tender heart. And remember, tend to be tender, you have to be pretty fierce and brave. If what I'm about to do is uh, new to you, and it seems a little odd or unusual, do the best you can. But another thing that, having been doing this for several years, I tell people, is you can take a short nap. <laughs> That might make you feel more tenderhearted, but it certainly does that for me. <laughs> and I think Doug would approve if you took a nap. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and begin. So what I'd like you to do is to sit as comfortably as you can in these chairs. And from my experience of being in this auditorium, they're not the most comfortable chairs. So you might have your hands on your lap, or you could put them on the armrest if you have the space to do that. Usually it's recommended that you position your legs and your feet in a way that you're not tensing them or holding them too much in tightness or in resistance. And um, you might close your eyes if you find that that's unusual. You can periodically open them to make sure that the people around you are not looking at you, okay? <laughs> Whatever makes you feel safe is the most important thing. And I will close my eyes, so feel free to keep them open and watch me if that finds See, that makes it soothing for you. <laughs> so just settle down and really take a moment as you begin to notice what might be pulling and tugging in your awareness. You might notice that some of what's present is related to what's happening now, what you've heard so far from Andrew, the beautiful music. Maybe there's emotion or wells of emotion that lead into thought. And that might even be felt in your body. And see what it is that you need to do at this moment to feel more settled, more present, to be here. And that might involve initially just shifting your position, moving whatever you need to move so that you feel comfortable and supported at ease. And then bring all of your awareness to your feet and relax them. You can always move the areas of the body that I mentioned if that makes it easier for you to feel better and comfortable. So relax the feet and legs. Relax the pelvis and just feel that from the waist down, the body is comfortably supported. And as you notice your back, try to align it in a way where it's straight but not tense or stiff. You might press it into the back of the chair and just allow the shoulders to relax and soften the hands. Lengthen the neck, soften the throat, relax the face, soften the eyes, make sure that the jaw is not tense. Let the tongue float in the mouth. And just move through the body again, just to check to make sure 
that you feel at ease, knowing that at any point during the centering you can change position. And then begin to turn with some curiosity to what's happening in your mind. You might notice the inclination of the mind into the past, into the future. Or maybe there are some present moment concerns that arise and seem to dominate that landscape of thought. And see if for a moment you can just observe that without getting caught in a story about it, seeing if it doesn't become a strong identification, it's just there. And then come back to your body and feel the body again, pressure, weight, temperature, softening those areas where you still feel resistance. And then very gently begin to focus more on your breath. Begin to follow it. And as you follow it, begin to notice all the different sensations that make you aware of your breathing. Remember the breath is something that's with us all the time. We tend to take it for granted. And like many things in our lives, we tend to pay attention to the breath when something is wrong or something is not the way you think it should be. See if for a moment you can just feel it. Rather than thinking about it, feel the sensations of pressure temperature, movement. So you might feel it in your chest or your belly, the movement that's there, or the movement of air through the sinuses and the windpipe, the nostrils. And just see what it takes to stay with the breath, to notice those moments where the mind takes us away, maybe a sound that leads to thinking, or maybe something that randomly appears in our thoughts. Maybe it's thoughts about being here. Or maybe something that you're doing later or happened earlier today. See if with each breath you can just feel like you're here, present in this body. Remember, the breath happens only in the body. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So you feel more settled in the body, more receptive to the breath. Now, if it feels comfortable for you, and only if it does feel comfortable, see if you can invoke and bring into your heart an image or a sense of Doug if that's meaningful to you. It doesn't have to be a big story. It could be maybe his smile, if you recollect it as an image, or maybe something he said to you that was funny or kind or provoking. And as you hold that sense of dug in your heart, allow yourself to soften around it so that you feel that his presence is felt through all of our recollection of these images or the sense of his goodness of his kindness, of his teaching, of his presence, however it manifested for you. And just feel that by holding that, we're all doing this collectively. We're all acknowledging the important part that he played in each of our lives. The gift of his presence, the gift of whatever it is that he offered to each one of us individually and also collectively as a community. And gradually as you release that sense of connection, however that manifested for you. See what remains in your heart and in your mind. Bring yourself back to the breath. Bring yourself back to the body. And then without opening your eyes, just begin to move your body in any way you'd like. Your toes, your fingers, you can move your head, 
Move your arms and legs, wiggle around a little bit. And then when you open your eyes, do it very deliberately. In other words, rather than just popping them open, that is if you close your eyes, just do it so that the light just gently comes in. And then as you do that, become aware again of what's present for you in your body, and your mind, and your heart. And if it feels comfortable to, for you to do this, take a look around you, the person to your right, the person in front of you, the person to your left. If you want to look around the room, just acknowledging that we're all here for a purpose. And this is part of a collective act of presence for someone that we all feel close in our hearts even now. So to close, I would like to read a, and many of you probably have heard, this is an excerpt from a poem by Merritt Malloy, Epitaph. Look for me and the people I've known or loved, and if you cannot give me away, at least let me live in your eyes and not your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch, by letting bodies touch, and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. Thank you, Louis. Apologize for being mixed up in the uh, music ceremony. Let's talk about one of Dad's other flaws. He was tone deaf. That didn't stop Dad's love of music, though, most any kind of music, except maybe hard rock or rap, which he and Mom called rah-rah music. As the son of a Renaissance guy, I was encouraged, he was strongly encouraged, really, by both my parents to learn to play an instrument. That encouragement began at the age of six when I learned to play a recorder. Later, it became the violin and then the guitar, but the compromise was that it had to be a classical guitar. I wasn't very good at any of them, but my heart was there. That must be genetic, too. Still, it was during my early childhood that I recognized Dad's musical flaw. One of the television shows I watched fairly frequently back then was Mr. Rogers. In every episode, Mr. Rogers sings at least one song. Dad liked to sing along with them. And that's when I came to discover that Dad was tongue deaf. Dad sang just slightly worse than Mr. Rogers, something I realized and told him as a six-year-old. And something in the family that has long been a recurring comment. But as an aside, after I left my parents' home, Dad, being the Renaissance guy that he was, took a few years of piano lessons, and Mom told him he eventually became pretty good. So let me now introduce, and maybe reintroduce, Professor Joe Miano and Dr. Rose Chancellor. Professor Miano came to know and love my parents soon after she and her family arrived at Plattsburgh. Joelle leads the choral vocal program at SUNY Plattsburgh. She wrote to me to say that Evelyn was a dedicated soprano in the Champlain Valley Oratorial Society, and Doug was always in the audience, an avid supporter of Evelyn and the arts. Dr. Rose Chancellor, whom you heard earlier, is the artistic director and founder of Piano by Nature. She frequently collaborates with music faculty here at Plattsburgh and with many musicians in our region and beyond. Joelle and Rose are going to play Bistu by Mia. This is a musical piece Dad told me a couple years ago that he would like to be heard and sung on this occasion. I'm not sure why, but perhaps it is again a reflection of his optimism because I've learned since then that the piece is really often played at wedding celebrations. Today we're going to be playing at a celebration of Dad's life. I think it's important to translate the lyrics. The lyrics being sung are, If you are with me, then I will go gladly to my death and to my rest. Ah, how pleasing would my end be if your dear hands shut my faithful eyes.
Doug Scott touched not just some people, but thousands of people. And he did so in a personal yet profound way. He was a quiet and humble giant who left an important legacy for us to continue. When I came to Plattsburgh in 1974, I was very young, having skipped eighth grade. And with my youth came immaturity, both intellectual and social. Dr. Scott was a very special professor. He saw my inner strengths and forced me to challenge myself of my preconceived and rather small notions of the world. His vaulted shunug, and I don't know if I pronounced that right. Mom, did I get that? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was that ideals should not be sacrificed and search for truth in history. He lived his ideals until his last breath, and I loved him for it. He and Evelyn opened their homes to me, but even more importantly, they opened their hearts. He had a remarkable impact on my life. As a result, I've given back to Plattsburgh to help many students fulfill their dreams as Dr. Scott helped me fulfill mine. Before he died, I wrote a letter to him to remind him how important a figure he had been in my family and in the lives of so many. A bright light, I wrote him, that has long been so long been illuminated that the darkness of the world would be dimmed. But it will not be extinguished. For as long as I am alive, as long as the many students you have touched walk this earth, that light, your light, will continue to be spread. Through us, Evelyn and Andrew, and now your grandchildren, your legacy will continue through our good deeds. In conclusion, I wrote Doug that I truly believe there is something more to our lives than just our earthly existence. I wrote, but if our legacy is simply how we lived our lives and who we touched and nothing more, then your existence will achieve immortality. To Evelyn and Andrew and the entire Cardinal community, I offer my sincere condolences on the loss of a great man and a Cardinal forever. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> Next in your program, you'll notice that Joe Salva was supposed to speak, but unfortunately we learned this morning he was called away and could not be here. I will just mention, though, a little bit about Joe that you told me. He told me that he was uncertain of what major he might take, but he took a history class in his first semester from Dad, and that led him to becoming a history major and having Dad as an advisor. Joe helped my father on the college history book that Dad wrote right with promise, and he went on to become an FBI agent. And I'm sorry that he's not here. Alana Hazleton Rodolph graduated from SUNY Plattsburgh in 1999, and she's here. <laughs> She's a history professor at Gilderville High School located near Albany. She took classes from Dad, and this led her to a career, pursue a career in teaching. And I'm going to let her take her, like, let her take it from there. Good morning. No one forgets a good teacher. Those words forever changed my life as I stood in front of a movie theater while studying abroad in Chester, England in 1998. I happened to see a display of free postcards, and this one black postcard popped out at me. I was a couple of months into the second semester of my junior semester and was taking classes in England after my advisor, Dr. Douglas Scott, had encouraged me to study abroad. I was a history major by this point, but until that moment, really had no idea what I wanted to do with my major. Let me rewind. During my second semester of my freshman year at Plattsburgh State, I signed up for European civilization since 1815. That spring, as I sat in Dr. Scott's class, I began to learn about history in a way completely foreign to me up to that point. For me, like so many, history classes in high school were textbook-based, with overhead notes, and homework that was just focused on regurgitating textbook information. For the first time, I was encouraged to really look at the people who made history and consider them as human beings who made choices not just as names on paper. We were asked to investigate events from other perspectives. We were asked to dig more deeply into the research we presented. We were asked to consider moral questions surrounding decisions that were made. In short, we were taught to think. 
But as so many of you know, there was something even more special about Dr. Scott than his excellent teaching. And that was the fact that he truly cared about his students and our educations. He wanted us to become better people, and in a world that needs this more than ever right now, no matter what your beliefs, I appreciate this type of academic and moral education so very much. As I was preparing what I wanted to say today, I actually pulled a few of my old papers out that I saved. His comments speak to the person that he was. At the end of one, a very good essay, Alana, as far as you go here. Thank you. And after his comments in another, my sincerest congratulations and thanks. And then a midterm comment, A minus, just because I think you can do even better. <laughs> thanks, always a thanks, and only because I know you can do even better. He pushed us and motivated us and turned us into the people we are today. If it isn't clear already, history truly came alive for me during that semester, and I couldn't wait to sign up for more classes taught by Dr. Scott. This is when I decided to declare history as a major, and I was lucky enough to get him as my advisor. Through the next few years, I learned so much about history, about life, about myself. I went from being an insecure high school student who got really high grades to being an actual student who was forced to confront tough questions about life, the people who have lived it, and the choices they made. I learned to think rather than just perform. From my Education Western Societies course to my junior seminar on fascism, I remember office hours, talking about papers, about class, about challenging myself, but also about how I was doing emotionally or just how my day was going. Yet I was still just a kid, unable to fully appreciate the history and life lessons I was being taught. So back to that moment at the cinema in England. I saw that postcard and I remember picking it up. I had been experiencing some homesickness and thought to myself, ooh, I can send this to Dr. Scott. When I got back to my dorm, I sat down and reflected on how much he had taught me during my years of class work. Not just about history, but about life, about being a good person, about having morals, about doing the right thing even when it's so hard to do so. And that night, sitting there, I remember saying to myself, I think I want to be a teacher. <laughs> I wanted high school kids to experience the same magic that I had found in Dr. Scout's classes. So, as soon as I got back from England, I declared secondary education social studies as a second major, and here I am today, 20 years into my career as a high school U.S. history teacher. It doesn't seem possible that it has been that long since I was sitting in one of his classes, but I really believe this is because his teachings are always with me. I tell my students stories he told us. I talk, them about, I talk about him every year at our open house as I tell parents what I hope their children will learn and how they'll learn it during the upcoming year. Since day one, I have been attempting to pass on the same lessons and values he taught me onto my students. His impact on me has never stopped. He helped him bring certain principles and important values within me at a crucial time of my life. And as I've gotten older, so many times echoes of his teachings have entered my brain. But it's not just those of us who are school teachers or college professors who can carry on Dr. Scott's legacy. Each and every one of us helps to spread Dr. Scott's teachings simply in the way we live our lives. So in response to Dr. Scott's own words from his book, Shadows Walking, that some human beings, men, women, and children, have been compassionate and conscientious, have shown great courage, have found ways to help others to be inspiring too, that no matter what the circumstances or conditions of their lives and times, that some have tried to do what is good and just, what is fair and responsible for their fellow human beings, for all living things, and for our planet. They, have, they that have lived lives worth living, lives worth emulating, and that their lives, because they were possible then, still are possible now. And most importantly, that my students should strive to live as they have lived. So I make this promise here and now to continue to do my best to have my students strive to live as they have lived. And if we all make that promise, Dr. Scott will always be right here with us and will continue to inspire countless students of future generations. Doug did not change it just because of dad. 
Promises we make to ourselves are the most important ones to keep. I'm grateful for that wisdom that Scott gave me 30 years ago, and I'm grateful to impart that wisdom to you today. I hope you take it to heart in the years to come, and I'll revisit this in a moment. It is written that for everything there is a season. And included in these seasons, I suppose, our grief, our learning and reason, and the season to act. Grief. Grief is a place that everyone thinks they know until they get there and realize they don't. To paraphrase John Dier. Doug was very deliberate. He knew we would be celebrating his contribution today. And so he set forth a few wishes and requests for this day, this moment, to celebrate his contribution. And among those was give a little time. Give a little time from my passing until you gather to celebrate whatever it is you want to celebrate. Give a little time to grieve and overcome. And then let your reason take over and your learning. And celebrate through your humanity and your reason this wonderful day. A time for learning and reason. Memory is the scribe of the soul, wrote Aristotle. The repository of learning that we maintain in our memories. Scott was a great teacher. He was deliberate at this, perhaps more than anything else. But I personally don't believe that his goal was to teach history for the sake of teaching history. Teaching history was his vehicle. He was a master of history, but he used history, sometimes the darkest moments of history, to teach and remind us of our responsibility and to promote goodness and ideals and virtues. He was a teacher of life. He was a great teacher because he used history to teach people, not just students, or his fellow faculty members or administrators or friends in the community, how to deal with life, to pursue, pursue their own meaningfulness, and most of all, discover in ourselves our own humanity 
and the consequences of all that we do. To apply ourselves to the greater good of the self and the greater good of all that is around us. And he did so with such deep compassion. And the time to act. Teaching history was for Doug an act of preparation, an act of preparation for each of us. It was a partnership. He had his responsibility and we have ours. And that time of preparation was not for the classroom, or graduation, or the commencement of a career, but for our own self, for our own individuality, and for our own humanity. And he was deliberate and determined about this for his own personal humanity and his own compassion because he saw in each one of us the potential for so much goodness, so much greatness. He believed anyone, any one of us could be a Martin Luther King, an Eleanor Roosevelt, a Mother Teresa, a Gandhi, a Churchill, a Lincoln. But he was also gravely aware that each of us had the potential for becoming their nefarious opposites. So he was committed to us. And he took it upon himself as a great and awesome responsibility to teach, to empower us to step into the light as we are the ones that need to take action. So, my friends, do you really want to memorialize Douglas Scott beyond this little hour? Do you want to celebrate him? Do you want to thank him for what he gave you, you students, alumni, faculty, administrators, friends, family, loved ones? Class is now in session. Professor Scott is with us now. In this room, and his teaching is reverberating off the walls of this hall. What does he say? Take action. Apply your lessons learned as you step into that light. Take care of each other. Love and fulfill the promises you make to yourself. I can count on one hand the most important people in my life. I know you all can too, it's a cliche. I love this institution because three of those five people. Thomas Moran, David Bowen, Douglas Scott, I know from this place. Not a lot of real estate on this hand. But as you think about it, if Douglas Scott is on this hand, and for many in this room, he's on your hand, and the hundreds, maybe thousands of others, who he touched so greatly by empowering them to step into the light. My friends, this man is not great. He was extraordinary. And I am part of who I am is because of him and all of you. Thank you. involved going to a big room in the student center and signing up for classes at different tables with different majors and a label on the front. I thought I was going to be a business major, but the line for the business table was really, really long. <laughs> and it was a history table. <laughs> no one in line at the history table. <laughs> and that's where I met Doug. He cheerfully signed me up that day for a few courses that made sense for a first semester freshman. I was on my way. I didn't forget him, though. 
A semester later, I tracked Doug down in his office and set in motion my transition to becoming a history major. I ended up taking only one full course with Doug during my four years here, and he wasn't my formal academic advisor. In fact, when I think of Doug, I think of him less as a professor and more as sort of a thoughtful and, and a generous elder who helped guide me through college and beyond. At the start of my sophomore year, Doug invited me to come on a Sunday to do some yard work at his house. Andrew was gone by this point, so he needed somebody to mow on. <laughs> and over the next three years, I spent many, many Sundays with Doug and Evelyn, working at their place and then staying for dinner. Doug would drive into town at 10 or 11 in the morning and then pick me up at whatever kind of miserable student apartment I was living at the time, and then take me back to their house. We'd work until about 5, have dinner, and then he'd take me back home again. Doug and I got to know one another on our drives back and forth. The three of us spent time together working around the yard, and I loved to sit and talk with Evelyn in the kitchen before dinner. It was a reliable and <clears throat> immensely comforting weekly routine. The home that Doug and Evelyn created was like a haven to me. The house was clean, Evelyn might have thought otherwise. It was clean, warm, bright, and full of books and great food. Cats came and went. The wood stove would be lit on cold days, and classical music always seemed to be playing softly in the background. There was something about the mix of intellectualism and practical outdoor labor that I encountered there. That was, and, and uh, to be told, it still is, irresistible to me. Sundays with the Scots were some of the most formative days in my life. I had sense enough to know it then, and I know it even more now. When I think of Doug then, I think of the Yellow House on the Military Turnpike. And equally important, when I think of that house, I think of Doug and Evelyn together. Watching Doug and Evelyn interact in their home and listening to how they talked about each other, to me, provided me with a model for how a married couple could live. A model that one's own parents, no matter how great they may be, can never really provide. Doug and Evelyn were the first adult couple to take an interest in me as an emerging adult myself. And because of that, I was extremely grateful and extremely receptive to their kindness and respect and generosity. But there was more to it than that. Watching them, I formed ideas about how a lasting relationship might unfold over time. And, in Doug's case, about how a husband might fit into a picture that's far, far bigger than himself. Doug's casual invitation to me to come and do some yard work at his house opened up a door into this lovely and gentle world that he and Evelyn created. A world where I learned a great deal about the kind of adult that I wanted to be. I'm still working on that, by the way. <clears throat> and although I have made some rather unconventional choices along the way, Doug's opinions and his continued interest in my life, from an unregistered student in 1988 to now, his opinions and his continued interest have always mattered to me. I've always wanted him to be proud of who I became and of the family that my wife, my daughters, and I have created. I think anybody in this room is fortunate to have someone in their lives as someone in their lives who they respect the opinions of as much as I respected Doug's. It's pretty clear that Doug had many such people in his life. I'm not alone. We're all here. And I'm grateful to count myself among you. Cynthia Newgarden and her husband Arthur were already fixtures here at the college when my parents arrived here and the four of them met. Arthur taught philosophy for many years here, and my dad and he bonded over that. Cynthia and my father, however, formed a bond over writing and poetry 
and the two of them took writing classes together. Before Dad died, Cynthia wrote a poem for him, and she'd like to read it. Cynthia. When I wrote this poem, I had tears in my eyes. A poem for Doug. You sought the truth, then followed where it led, and bravely wrote the book that told the tale. We read your pages, dazed by what they said, and praised your courage that will never fail. Your courage, yes, that may be tested soon, but more than bravery lights your gifted way. Your ear for music, the effervescent tune of woodland hillsides, melodies that play accompaniment to all our sweetest thought. You are a poet. We treasure what you say. Your wise encouragement we often sought. And now our hearts are broken, and we pray unending prayers for you, our precious friend, knowing your love of life can never end.
He perceived that we must know clearly the ideals we value and express our commitment to those ideals with such frequency and power that we never lose sight of them. He understood that wisdom does not come to us on a rainbow, so he faced hard truths. He scrutinized the historical record of humankind and realized that in every society there are forces at work that pull even good people into indifference to injustice. His fundamental awareness was that in an otherwise dark universe, recognizing our common humanity is the only way to light a path to a decent future. He had faith that we could do so. He didn't think the task was easy. He simply thought it was essential. Doug chose to live in invincible hope. He believed that we must act in the hope that what we do will make a positive difference. And since we may not know the outcome in our lifetimes, we must also live in faith that it will. I began to get a reading on Doug. And it's rather funny hearing everyone here. Most of the people have been up on stage, even though I knew him since 1972, probably spent more time with him. And this is what was unique about our relationship. After those early years, I mean, we continued in the department, we stood up for certain things, we talked about things. But we really, our life in the college went different directions. I went multidisciplinary, I went Latin American studies. Um, he moved in other circles and did other things. So we really didn't have a chance to share much together. We really didn't interact much at all during those years. There weren't occasions where we met in an afternoon or talked with one another. There were two times, however, that seemed to typify um, our relationship. The first was, I think it's sometime in the early 90s, we were at the American Historical Convention in New York City. You never know what you're going to get on the hotels that you're assigned. And Doug and I were stuck in one of these, I guess today they'd be called boutique hotels, up on some attic floor. But we spent the night together just kind of rehashing the first 15 years or 20 years of our experiences at Plastic State. The second time was in 1998, in January. Now, that was a great time to be in Washington, if everybody remembers. And Doug and I were assigned the Mayflower Hotel. And we all, we all agreed as kind of crappy that room back in 1992 or so was. Staying in the Mayflower, we'd never been in a swankier room in our lives. And we marveled at that. And other important visitors were staying in the Mayflower that year, that, that time too, if you remember. But we had a chance to kind of talk about things. And every time we got together, we talked about things that matter deeply in our lives. We review family and what was going on in family life. We would review what was going on in the world. We would talk about where we were in life at that point and what we thought about life. So in a way, I was kind of a narrator. Seeing Doug from a third person point of view and watching as he negotiated life. And I observed that Doug had a prophetic voice. All you have to do is read the Bible and read the prophets and see how, in a way, a kind of a lonely experience it was and how constantly stating your, your point of view Constantly challenging people that need to be challenged. 
it weighed on you. It's not an accident that Lamentations is in the Bible. And what I saw, and I'm just a third person, what I saw was a person who who felt the way we spoke of. Who felt the weight of the world steadily grow as he got older. Because it was so humane. He felt things very deeply. And I don't think it's an accident that he turned from history, that book that he never quite finished, and spent much of the last part of his life, even the last few weeks, Revising a new translation for Shadows of Walking. I think that was his life work. I think that's the reflection of where he kind of found himself towards the end of his life. And then, cancer struck. I remember all of us going up to CVPH and he had his kidney uh, removed and we wanted his kidneys. No, not kidneys. Yes, it is. Um, and it was just a chance for us to kind of get together and kind of friends, kind of take stock of where we were now. What was going to happen to Doug? We knew he was just easing out in terms of retirement, but what would that mean? And I think the last nine years have shown that Doug changed. That the kind of sadness we saw in his life, because of his humaneness and because he cared about the world, That that sadness became increasingly a joyous life. We all see him, we all saw him during those years. I'm sure that the public life center was an important way that people saw him. He guessed at classes. I know he went up to Serenade Lake and he, he gave lectures, talks with the high school students there. Uh, Jack and Peg Myers, who was there before even me and Doug. Uh, invited us to join about three years ago to go out to eat with Doug in the evening with he and Evelyn. Become something we did regularly for the last three years. What I noticed was that Doug, as humane as he was, as much as he believed in the worth of each and every one of us, he became more engaged with the divine in these years. He seemed to sense that the macro world, which he still cared about, and which pained him greatly, that the macro world was there, it would be there, but the micro world, the micro world of his days, the micro The micro world of his life and his relationships that micro world was a world where he could find joy and he did as Tom said he found it a gift each day was a gift each relationship was And for all of us, that he recognized that.